thank you for attending. Um, this is your agenda for today. Uh, I'd like to know a little about you so I can play around with, with I, what I have to tell and what I won't tell uh, because of the time. Uh, tell you a little about me, about my company, uh, and then we'll dive into the case, which is about uh, building a tracking platform uh, with Vertex, Angular, Redis, and deploying it on Cloud Foundry uh, eventually. Uh, a little bit about you. Who's here from a developer perspective and developing apps at the moment? Who's familiar with Vertex? Ah, cool. That's a takeaway for most of you then uh, today. With Redis? Right. Also cool. Angular? Please. Uh, ah, I'll explain a little then. Most of the times uh, each hand uh, goes up and I don't have to explain it and that saves me some time also. Um, Who's here from an operations perspective? Who is managing Cloud Foundry at the moment? Sort of. Uh, you're my heroes. Uh, <laughs> I'm not able to do it. Um, all right, thank you. A little bit about me. Uh, during the keynote, uh, I mentioned, uh, I saw that everybody was talking about their kits, so I put in this slide. Uh, these are my two guys. Uh, the van behind them is my third kit. Uh, they think they own it. And they say they own it, but if the van goes for maintenance, I have to pay the bill. So uh, we're not there yet, but uh, well, it's cool. It's a nice van. It's really something you should. Uh... We love them too. Yeah, yeah. the kids or the van? The van. <laughs> ah, <laughs> all right. <laughs> now let's keep it. <laughs> let's keep it simple. Uh, I'm the founder and managing partner of J Driven, so that's my day job. Uh, that's also the reason that the van exists, uh, because I was working 24 hours a day because working is fun for me, but spending time with the kids is also fun. So we bought the van, and now we're going out for the weekends with the van, and that's also uh, really fun. I love to code, solar, surf, create all kinds of things uh, when I'm not at work, or when, I'm, <laughs> when I can, I'm able to combine it. I exist on Twitter, please follow me. Uh, you can ask me some questions afterwards, that's also no problem, but reach out to me on Twitter if you have additional questions. It's my company, small consulting firm in the Netherlands. Uh, we are about 33 people big now. We're doing enterprise development uh, for large customers and helping them to create beautiful software. Uh, and we do that in all aspects of enterprise development. So architecture, uh, software development, uh, but also uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Uh, and we're trying to do that together with our customers and get the customer and its organization on a higher level. And j also exists on Twitter. Uh, if you were in early, you already saw uh, the website uh, live, but this is what we're going to build today. Uh, a web application which makes it possible for me to track where my van is, or make it possible for other people to track where the van is, because most of the time I'm inside. How did we manage to build that? Uh, I told you that when I'm uh, away with my van, um, I'm not willing to work. I'm not wanting to try to... Uh, create something with a Raspberry Pi or something. I did not create a tracker device myself. I bought something online. Uh, this tracker is about $20. You can buy it uh, on Alibaba or which, uh, whichever site you want to use. Um, it has GPS tracking in it. And you can put a SIM card in it and then you can send text messages, but you can also configure it to send data to an IP address and port. And that's what we're going to use today. It also has some additional features uh, with the, which they tend to describe as security f features like blocking your engine, uh, building an alarm on it. But uh, yeah, that's basically the next slide. If I tell you about specifications, you don't want to use this professional. This is nice for a hobby, nice to track something, but don't use it to secure your car because it's not secure. Um, yeah, and actually, the website you saw is, is the part on the right. So the combination uh, of the data uh, flowing through the system and showing up in real time on the website. Uh, this slide is not to explain you the protocol in, in depth, but uh, I added this slide because uh, at the time, most integrations you build between systems are using JSON, XML, uh, over HTTP, maybe some messaging, maybe some SOAP if you're lucky. Uh, but uh, this is something different. What you have here is just a plain socket connection and sending bits and bytes over it, and you have to reply back. 
so basically what the, the tracker does, it makes a uh, TCP connection as soon as it's alive. It sends a login package and ex expects some bits and bytes back uh, in the right order with the right checksum, which you have to uh, calculate yourself. And then it starts sending location details on a frequency you can configure. And you have to acknowledge the fact that you have received it. So it's pretty low level. It's pretty efficient. Uh, and it's pretty badly documented. Uh, if we had some more time today, I would have asked you what the mistake in the formula is here, but that's actually from the documentation, and it's not gonna work. So what we had to do, we implemented uh, uh, it yeah, from the specification, but actually we, we uh, stored lots of packets from the tracker itself, and we reverse engineered the protocol afterwards. So each packet we received, uh, we put through a unit test and we see if we understand what's in it. Building the application, we used uh, Cloud Foundry to deploy it, Vertex and Redis for the back end, and Angular uh, in the front end. Uh, there are some people familiar with Vertex. Um, I guess I have enough batteries, so that's not an issue. <laughs> there are some people familiar with Vertex, but I would like to give a short introduction. Uh, it's a lightweight, high-performance application framework. Well, everybody says that, so that's not uh, that exciting. But uh, lightweight, uh, uh, most of the times for my company, when we develop on Cloud Foundry, we develop using Spring Boot. Uh, and I love Spring Boot. Actually, uh, we're rebuilding this same case uh, using Spring Boot at the moment to compare the two. Uh, that's OK. Um, but uh, Vertex is more lightweight than Spring Boot. Why is Vertex more lightweight? Because it doesn't do that much for you. You just have a runtime environment and pretty simple APIs uh, to play with. Uh, cool thing about Vertex is that you can write your pieces of program in different languages. Uh, I will use Java uh, through my slides. In a former version, I used Groovy that had one uh, benefit because the code examples fit on my slides. Uh, Java's a little more verbose, but it's fine to have your type system behind you. But you could use other languages. You could use JavaScript and all kinds of uh, languages. Uh, it's simple, is what I was saying. It's just a way of writing code using the APIs Vertex offers you. The APIs are asynchronous, everything is asynchronous, and that makes it possible for you to create really scalable, lightweight apps, uh, which uh, in fact, very well suit the fact that we have to connect several sockets from GPS trackers. You, you don't want to manage the stage yourself, the concurrency yourself. Vertex is very good at that. Yeah, and it's extensible. Uh, I've worked with Vertex from version 1. Version 1 was really uh, an abstraction above Netty. I don't know if somebody's familiar with Netty. It's a, uh, yeah, a pretty powerful library to do uh, fancy I.O. Uh, in Java. Um, and it was very low level. And basically, if you wanted to create a web server or a web application using Vertex, you had to parse the HTTP request yourself, set the right headers, and give the right response back. Well, that's not uh, anymore. It's now very powerful. You have features to use templating, to use routes in HTTP, so you can create very nice applications using Vertex. Uh, from this picture, uh, I don't have the time to go into this uh, in depth, but the most important things to remember are verticals, because basically verticals are the parts of our application we write our logic in. Uh, and there are simple components that receive messages, send messages, communicate using the asynchronous AP API with uh, other systems, or receive data from other systems. And the verticals it, they themselves interact with each other using the event bus. So they will publish and subscribe messages to each other over the event bus. Uh, the cool thing about the vertical is that Vertex guarantees you that uh, there's only one thread in the event loop that handles uh, the logic in your vertical. So all your handlers, you were just there. You'll see an example later on. Uh, everything in your vertical is handled by one thread. Uh, and that's pretty powerful because you don't have to uh, juggle around with state. Uh, you can just trust it that the state you build up is only accessed uh, once at a time. But the world isn't asynchronous. We still have things that are synchronous. And that's where working verticals come in. 
What you do then is you will send a message over the event bus to another vertical and that uses a classical thread pool and will communicate with your legacy database or all kinds of other synchronous stuff. Um, one thing to remember, Vertex will complain if you don't remember, is that you do should not block the event loop. So don't do anything in your vertical that doesn't, uh, that, that is not asynchronous. Don't use a thread sleep there or, or something else. Use the scheduling API. For example. Verticals, uh, I mentioned most of it. This is a basic vertical to create a web server. Um, it's just extending an, a class. I have a start method in which I implement uh, my logic, and what you'll see that we're doing there is registering handlers for messages on the event bus, or as we do here, creating an HTTP server, uh, sending something back if a response comes in, and uh, make it listen on port 88. We'll go into some verticals in more detail later on. The event bus, um, the way to communicate between the parts of your uh, application, uh, you can do that using uh, publish subscribe. So I'll publish something, you're interested, you will receive it, and you do something with it. I can use send and receive, uh, which looks like a bit like a publish subscribe, but uh, is uh, to do point to point communication. So I'll address you all, but one of you will pick my sentence or my message up, do something with it, and when I'll address you all again, somebody else will pick it up. So I can use it to round robin uh, my load. And I can reply on it, so you can tell me something back, and I can use that. Uh, something that really helps making uh, reactive apps with a web interface is that the, the fact that you can bridge the event bus uh, to the client side. So you can uh, make the application, the Angular application in our case, in the browser part of the messages that are going on in your system. So for instance, uh, if a location event comes in, I'll publish it and I'll receive it in my web interface and I can show it on the, uh, on the map. More on that in the uh, examples. Um, this is some simple code uh, which illustrates how to use the event bus. One thing to know is that, uh, and to remember, is that the event bus isn't doing anything with guarantees. So the fact that your message is received is not something you can count on. You have to keep it in mind. So don't build your next uh, banking backend on Vertex unless you manage that yourself. This is the architecture we're going uh, to build. And basically, we have the sensor in our van. It talks to a vertical that uh, accepts the socket connections and publishes events with the location details in it. So it translates the bits and bytes to JSON. We'll store it using a vertical with persistence in Redis. We'll enrich it, which is out of scope for today, but still in the slides if you download the slides uh, later on. Um, and we'll also publish the enriched location event to the web vertical, which will pass it on to uh, everybody who's looking uh, from the web browser. And the cool thing to remember here is that uh, the, arrow, the direction of the arrows is very natural. An event comes in, it flows through our system and it pops up, enriched, uh, in our web browser. So we're not doing things here like storing everything in a database and getting it out when we need it. No. If a location update com comes in, we'll show it directly in the browser. Those are the two, three verticals we're going to have a deep dive in. This is the first one. This is the one that's talking with uh, the trackers. And this is very simple. This is even simpler than uh, the, the web example you saw before. What it does, it creates a server uh, on a port and a host, and it registers a connect handler, which gets triggered when a device connects. And when a device connects, the handler is executed. We'll grab the socket ID, so we have something to identify it by. Uh, by. Um, and we register a connection handler. And what happens is each time packages arrive, the connection handler is triggered. And basically what we do, uh, we create a message body from the raw bits and bytes. So behind that Java function is something that uh, translates uh, the, the, the table you saw before into readable JSON with a latitude, longitude, speed, uh, GPS uh, statistics like the, the amount of satellites. And it publishes it on the event bus. Uh, and basically, on that address is listening uh, is 
uh, another component listing which will handle uh, imagine this is a very simple vertical uh, we'd like to store the location details so it's not uh, a goal by itself to just show the location on a map but we want to store all location details in Redis uh, at this time um, I was familiar with Redis before I created it, and for me, Redis was just a key value thingy. It's something you use for a cache uh, that performs pretty well, but uh, I didn't dive deeper into it until now. Uh, but it's pretty powerful for, for such cases uh, because it supports transactions, uh, publish and subscribe, and also a time to live. So you can expire your data when you store it, and Redis will arrange that for you. Um, you can add clients to Redis and communicate with Redis from virtually any language. The client's uh, libraries are very lightweight. And Vertex has a client built in. And the cool thing is that when you look at, at Redis, basically it's a key value store, but the value can have uh, different forms. So you can store a string as a value. Think of it as a hash map in Java. Uh, and this is pretty powerful for us because what we can do, we can uh, we send messages through our system that contain JSON. And we can put JSON into a string and store it in Redis. The reason why we use JSON is that uh, if you are going polyglot and you're using different languages within your Vertex application, JSON is a pretty easy format to marshal and unmarshal in each language. So that's why we're using JSON also internally. Uh, we have lists. Think of it as an array list. You just append to the list. We have sets. Each item is unique. Uh, and we have a very po very powerful uh, variant of sets, and that's a sorted set. And the cool thing of a sorted set is, besides the fact that you just put in uh, more data in the set that's unique, you can add a score. Uh, and in our case, we're using the timestamp of the, uh, the, the moment we received the uh, coordinate as the score. And that gives us the power to uh, grab the last element or grab all locations within a certain time frame just from a Cree value store. How are you using uh, those messages? What we are going to do here is we're going to store the enriched location details. So the location uh, of JSON. We're going to uh, grab the body. We want to receive that. So at which moment did we receive the message? We want to uh, grab the device ID. And basically what we do is we create a key in the form of tracker uh, device ID location receives that. So that's the key in our Redis store. Um, and we store each location update in a sorted set. And we do that by specifying the key, specifying the score, the received add, and putting the whole JSON message in there. Uh, and that makes it possible for us to ret uh, retrieve the most recent location, or the most recent 10 locations, if we modify the last zero uh, to a 10. But it also makes it possible for us to request the data uh, by score. Uh, so for instance, request all coordinates within an hour and see uh, what we're going to do there. And the nice thing of this is that um, it's, it's blazingly fast because Redis optimizes the, fed, the way you wrote your data for reading. So you have instant response if you want to uh, request it and it scales out very, very good. So if you have thousands of trackers, that's not an issue. Angular. Uh, there, there were some people that are not that familiar with Angular. Um, I'm not going to give you a deep dive uh, in Angular now, but what we basically did here, Angular is a framework to build rich JavaScript applications in. It has some patterns in it that are very familiar for, for instance, Java developers, so that helps to write uh, great software. It does some very neat things with binding your data you have in your application with the data that you're showing to your users. And that's uh, very powerful. And we're going to use that here to show the data in real time. Um, but first, we need a web server. We have to push or make it able for our uh, users to request all web resources. So that's also a vertical uh, in, in Vertex. What we do here is we, uh, in the start method, we create a router. And the router we can use to uh, specify on which path uh, resources should be available. Uh, 
And we add a static handler. And static handler is just something that serves static files. That's why it's called a static handler. From a certain path, from your file system or your class path, through the browser. So basically what it says here is, well, we have a folder called webroot and everything that's in there, my index.html, my JavaScript files, my CSS files, just serve it out. That's fine. And we add one other thing. That are, those are four lines of code and they're the most powerful lines of code in this presentation because what they do is they allow you to distribute the event bus to the uh, uh, client side. So basically, uh, I can use JavaScript library and connect to the slash event bus pod, and I will receive all messages on the client side also. So my location updates and all the details. Um, the reason we use permitted options is somebody willing to explain me why I put it in there. Why would you want to do that? Suppose I have to answer it myself. <laughs> now, now, what you don't want is every event from the client to the server and from the server back, because uh, internally, the, the communication with Redis also works with events. So uh, what I don't want is to send a command from JavaScript to clear my Redis database. So you can see this as kind of a firewall -y thing. I define a regular expressions, and only addresses that start with web are allowed to come into my system or allowed to come from my server to the client just to prevent some issues uh, that we don't want. And finally, we have to start listening. That's what we do. And this is all, uh, all the code we need to create a web server which serves our static files, which create an event bus bridge, uh, which allows us to show the details on the map. A little piece of the Angular code I'd like to show you. Uh, not to understand uh, every letter of it, uh, but basically the concept uh, is the same as all, all the verticals we saw. This is JavaScript code. This is somewhere in one of my Angular controllers. And what I'm doing here is, well, I have an event bus service. That's an Angularized uh, event bus service. Um, and I just say, well, I want to listen to web.device.location. And each time an event comes in with that address, I'll store it on the scope in an hash map in JavaScript uh, for the device edition. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm storing the last location of my verticals. And the cool thing is that if I listen to the right events and I build up the state uh, on the client side, I'm able to add dynamically uh, generated graphs to the right data and they will uh, if, if my speed differs, that's the, the actual speed per device, uh, it will adjust the graph because that's what Angular does with data binding. Um, and that's also working for the map. So if you have, uh, you're you trying to do something with maps, have a look at Leaflet. Leaflet is very powerful and gives you an abstraction on top of things like OpenStreetMap and Google Maps, but also gives you the option to write your logic not bound to, for instance, Google. Um, and what you're doing here is... Uh, the trick paths is also an angular variable on the scope, which contains all paths that form the trip that you see on the map there. And if I add another part to it, to my trip, uh, it will show up in real time on the map. So you will see the fan moving. You'll also see the trip moving. For deployment, um, initially we developed this uh, just as a demo. Um, um, not with Cloud Foundry in mind. So uh, the cool thing was, how much time do we need? How much effort do we need to make this run on Cloud Foundry? Um, we deployed it on uh, Pivotal Web Services, uh, publicly available uh, variant of Cloud Foundry. And basically, it are, the, there are two applications, the platform, the website you're looking at, uh, and the part that analyzes the data, and the receiver, and the receiver is the the, the component that communicates with the trackers. And we use one service that we share between both apps. I'll tell you a little bit more about why we do that later on. Um, the first thing, uh, I was really enthusiastic about this conference because I wanted to see 
how many people are using Cloud Foundry. I'm really surprised, happily surprised about the power of the community behind Cloud Foundry. So I didn't realize that I needed TCP routing at that moment. Thanks. Um, so uh, one of the guys at Pivotal helped me out. Uh, I had some beta access to uh, TCP uh, routing on uh, run at Pivotal that I have. Uh, and basically the way I use TCP routing here uh, are those three comments if you have to do it manually and not in your, your manifest. But I'm creating a, a random route on a random port uh, uh, and I'll request the routes later on. I need that route, TCP route, because my tracker only talks TCP. So I'm not able to yeah, put that over the normal routing. Uh, and that's also why... Oops, that's the uh, slide now. The, the, basically, you have to look at this and remember the port. We're going to play with that later on. Um, because I have to, my application was configured just to run uh, on its own. What I'm doing here is uh, grabbing the application configuration from the environment. So I have to grab the port for each application. That's what I'm doing here. And I have to request all uh, uh, service configuration and use that uh, to find out where my red is, it, what its credentials are, uh, things like uh, that. And one thing uh, I didn't notice at first because the WebSocket implementation in Vertex falls back to long pool if WebSockets aren't supported, which is pretty powerful, but I didn't saw that it didn't work. Um, at least at uh, PWS, you have to use uh, PWS, you have to use port 443 for your WebSockets. If you just use the HTTPS or HTTP, uh, HTTP port, it won't work. So that's something to realize. Um, and this was the initial application. Um, and then we had to use a TCP route and an HTTP route to the same application. And that's not possible at the moment. So what we did is we split up the application. Uh, we wrote the receiver, which has the TCP route. So all traffic comes in over TCP and we separated the platform, which handles the HTTP request. Uh, that led to another problem, and that's that uh, the receiver and the plat uh, platform application can communicate between each other. Uh, and one of the features of Redis is very powerful, is that in, uh, you can store data in it and retrieve it, but you can also create channels in Redis and use that for publishing and subscribing. So basically what we do here is cheat a little and use Redis as a bridge uh, to publish my location updates and receive it uh, in the platform. Some last remarks. Uh, I really enjoyed the, the, the developer experience. I was familiar with uh, Cloud Foundry uh, for several years, but always used Spring Boot. So the, the, the chance to do something with Vertex on it was for me an, a chance to get to know the platform better and do some things manually that Spring Boot does for you. Uh, yeah, the, the operation guys are my heroes because I tried to install uh, it myself because I needed TCP routing and Redis and I didn't manage to do that uh, in three, four long nights. So uh, uh, that's not happening often. Um, but I didn't need lots of changes to migrate the existing app. Uh, what you'll notice is that you want you develop an app for Cloud Foundry, please have a look at the platform you're actually using because each Cloud Foundry installation has different options. I have to use Redis to communicate, uh, but if you have the full power and you could, do, uh, you could do something with security groups and configuration, you can allow the applications to talk uh, directly and use the clustering of the event bus. So uh, yeah, please look at which Cloud Foundry you're developing for. Yeah, and TCP routing is very, very powerful. It really helps in the IoT space, uh, in the talk, uh, I saw before you see it also as just opening up a port to use MQTT and directly on Cloud Foundry, which is a fun talk by itself. Because that's uh, fun. Thanks for your time. If you have any questions and we have any, we have some time left. Uh, I don't know. Please ask them. Please ask them. Don't be afraid. When you start the trip. <laughs> I just finished a trip last weekend, I went to uh, Donberg and I was very glad that I'm not here with uh, Van uh, because it took some time uh, by, uh, by my own car and Van isn't uh, going to speed up uh, 
more than 80 kilometers an hour. So thanks for your time. Uh, if you're willing to uh, have a chat or some additional questions, reach out to me on Twitter or uh, talk to me later on in the conference. Thank you very much.